this looks like fun, you guys. Hi. I'm going to talk with you about practicing the art of seeing. I'm sort of a photographer, but really I'm not. I'm, I'm much more interested in the process of seeing, and over time I've come to understand that that's what really makes me, that's what really excites me, and the camera has just become an instrument for how to express what stops me and how I see. And I want to talk to you about that today. There's nothing sweeter than to be stopped in my visual tracks by something. Um, and I'm going to just scroll through here so you can watch as I go through this. And in this case, this was something that literally stopped me in my tracks. In fact, it was my tracks. <laughs> we were at the beach and I was gawking at the sun um, coming up over the horizon and the way the water was shimmering and it was a partly cloudy day and it was just gorgeous. Janice and I were standing there looking up gawking and I could feel the light waves lapping at my feet very lightly and my feet were sinking into the sand. And for some reason I decided to look down and when I did I couldn't believe that that was happening and then I stepped back and took one shot. Mm -hmm. and in about 30 seconds, another wave came in and wiped it clean. <laughs> so, for me, I think the world is full of visual poetry. And it can happen at any point, at any time. Since here, this little sweet moment happened when I was putting the groceries away. Last week, we were up in Birmingham and we went into a local Mexican place to get takeout. And all the seats were covered in plastic. And I just looked across the way and saw this. And I have my camera. I always, always, always have my camera. I never leave the house without it. In fact, you'll see something I'll show you later of something I took in my neighbor's house one morning, went over to a high-end Zeiss German lens on it. It's a great little camera. It takes really wonderful images. Um, and the processor in here is about as big as the ones in digital SLRs. So there's a lot of data, which allows me to make them a little bigger if I want to and hold the resolution. Um, but really, this isn't that important. It's the lens here that's connected to the processor here and the processor here. That is where the magic happens. Yeah. Well, you sort of jumped ahead there, didn't you? Oh, I see. Okay. So, this, oops, sorry. This is the restaurant. This is something I saw at a friend's house walking into their kitchen when I was over there one day. This was a piece of trash in the gutter floating um, in some water that had accumulated after it rained and I couldn't believe that it was arranged the way it was. For me, I see an older person carrying their groceries home. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, this was not a, uh, none of what you're going to see today is posed. I didn't arrange it. I was just walking up the street. I used to live in New York City and this was something on a restaurant table out front and I just happened to glance left as I went by and and there it was. So, Lordy, sorry. <coughs> so for me, the most important part of being able to see the world like this, this is something in my living room, is to slow down. Uh, slow down, clear my mind, try and turn off the internal chatter. I'm never going to find a good picture. I can't do this. Will I find something? If I find something, will it be really good? Try and just shut that out. Try and not have any worries about um, whether I'm going to succeed or fail. I turn off the external chatter. I turn off my phone, um, especially when I'm out in, in a dedicated time frame to try and look at things and just see what's right in front of me. So I'm up at UAB going to a doctor's appointment and after I get out of my car and I walk across part of the parking deck, I see a red car up against the wall and this light is bouncing off of the car and onto the wall. I'm in the uh, Seattle airport on my way home from a visit out there and if you ever go out to Terminal A, there's an escalator that takes you up into the terminal 
And as we stepped off the tram, this is what we saw. And Janice looked at me, and I looked at her, and she said, take it. <laughs> it it's, um, it's one of those moments for me where the graphic elements in the visual world really uh, come together. Um, we have a Japanese maple out in front of our house, and every fall it turns wonderful colors. And for a week I was taking those leaves against the blue sky. And one morning I came out with my camera, I'm going to go take some more. And they, they had all fallen out of the tree. And I thought, oh, man. And I walked over, and this was the best photo all week. It was just an arrangement, and there it was. And that's one of Janice's pieces of pottery. So it was kind of a joint collaboration. Or I'm at John's uh, service station in Cloverdale, and I'm getting some service done. It isn't going to take long, but I don't want to sit in the... Uh, the waiting area because it's just wasting my time. So I walk down the alleyway and a little bit further down from the gas station there's a window and there's some plastic on the window and it's bubbled up. And there it is. So you can practice serendipity. I'm convinced of it. We're on our way to Costco and all of a sudden this flock of birds comes flying by and Janice and I are like, look, it's a murmuration. And then all of a sudden we got just to the corner and all these birds landed on this power line. <laughs> Jenna said, pull over. We pull over. I jump out of the car. And of course, I got my camera, so I can take a couple of pictures, and then uh, literally 10 seconds later, they were gone. <laughs> okay, I've got to stop talk, talk, touching my. Uh, okay, there we go. Is that the next one? Yeah. Well, I'm pulling into the uh, Johnson Center in Troy for a show, somebody else's show, and I see <laughs> these stains on the wall. I mean, I think they look like a waterfall, and I almost get run over in the process <laughs> pulling in. Or I'm making breakfast, the light's coming through the window, I've just poured our orange juice on the counter. The light is playing through the dish drainer and bouncing on the glass, and I'm thinking, wow, that's a, a wonderful abstract. Or we go for a walk in the afternoon during the summer, and the clouds in Alabama are fabulous. Mm -hmm. and. This was just a dragon formation. Mm -hmm. Jenna said, oh, that's Pluto. I said, no, it's a dragon. It's an alligator. So anyways, it was pretty astounding. It is a dragon, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we were down at um, the shore, and uh, we just came around the corner. We had coffees in our hand, and uh, it was actually a very disorienting moment because I couldn't quite figure out what I was looking at, and it turns out there was an upper courtyard and they had tore the face of one part of that building off and the, uh, wow. the palm tree was, um, the shadow from the palm tree in front of that was playing on the wall and it was just one of those wonderful wacky moments. Mm -hmm. So as I said, I try not to have any preconceived mm -hmm. idea about what I'm going to see um, at a friend's house helping him do something else and I see this on the table. It might sound counterintuitive to stop thinking in order to be able to see like this, but this is something that is tried and true for me. Every image you see here comes out of working with that kind of a process. So I know it works. Whether that works for anybody else, I don't know. I, I hope some of what I'm talking about and show you will resonate. And you can think about how it might play, uh, come to play in whatever art medium that you're working in. I'm the afternoon dishwasher. And I had just dumped the glasses in the sink. And I said, where's my camera? <laughs> and this is really a wonderful moment of practicing serendipity. I decided to go out into um, Otonka County. I was driving down a dirt road I'd never been down before. I had no idea what I was going to see. And a car mm -hmm. went whizzing by in the other direction. And the light started playing through the dust. So I pulled over and jumped out and took this picture. That's, that's serendipity. That's exploring, being curious, and then it happens. Or I'm roaming around in the parking lot behind um, Tomatino's and uh, the Pine Bar. There's a parking lot in the back, and somebody has a Jag back there, mm -hmm. and it's as you know spotlessly clean as you can imagine. And one day I just happened to glance, and the reflection that was bouncing off that was coming off of the there was a reflection of the building bouncing on the car. And this is just looking down from the back end of the car, looking towards the front with the side view mirror and the window. Um, and it was just this wonderful, wacky moment of total abstract that came out of nowheres. Um, you know, somebody once described it as unconditional expression. That is, you don't have to any, you don't have to have any pre-California, and this is Monterey Bay. Um, uh, one morning at dawn. Um, 
a table down at Prevail Coffee after it rained one day, and I was just poking around through there. Uh, the building across the street is kind of a pinkish color, and it was playing in the table, and these beads of water from the rain were on the table. Um, and there I was. Um, you know, I <coughs> were out in the woods up in Lake Martin walking. I couldn't possibly ever dream up. I don't have enough, I have very little creativity, and certainly not enough to create these kinds of images. This is uh, dirt in the street after it rains, because we walk every day. We're trying to stay healthy. Or something, again, that we see at the beach. Um, a friend of mine described how oftentimes he's stopped by something, and ultimately what he takes the picture of isn't what he was stopped by. That is, he stopped, and he starts really paying attention, and then he kind of settles into awareness. He settles into looking, and he, calls, he called it shifting gears. And then he looks, and he looks more, and he sees something, and then he ultimately takes a picture of that. So it isn't always the first thing. If you really, if you let go and relax, um, those sorts of things can um, come to your eye. Um, and I, I, I just love being curious. I was poking around in my neighborhood after it rained one day, and I decided, I don't know why, I just decided to go over and look in the trash cans in the park. And this was one of those trash cans. Uh, and the way that that trash in the bottom and the way that the bag was pulling down, I just thought, oh my God, it's a flower or something. It's not a trash can. What am I looking at? So, um, Gloucester, Massachusetts, walking along a, a man-made uh, water break, look, just looking one morning. I go out by myself a lot because when you're with somebody, it can sort of distract you. You really do need to settle into seeing, and one of the ways you do that is to go out by yourself and be quiet. Mm -hmm. um, and this just appeared out of nowhere as I was walking on the top of that stone wall, this boat floating. It was a foggy morning, and the mist had just lifted out of that little cove. Where we go out on our porch every morning and have coffee, and this past fall, this <coughs> magnolia leaf was sitting on top of the glass table out on the porch when I came out, and uh, it was a really sweet <coughs> visual moment. I'm walking home from work. This is from a time when we lived in New York City, and this was hanging on the balcony. <coughs> so, the more I do this, sorry, the more I do this, the more I practice this, the um, the more refined it gets, the more I see it, the more often I see it. Um, this was a reflection. I was looking through a window in a house in our neighborhood that's abandoned, and this was a reflection of the street as well as the window across the room. Um, and I was just poking. I just decided to go look. And while everything that I show you here I think is pretty good, <laughs> I'm showing you 135 images. I'm sure I've taken at least a quarter million images since I started 20 years ago. That's no lie. And so the bulk of what I do um, isn't really viewable. <laughs> but it really teaches me how to make these kinds of images when, they, when I see them and I can be stopped by them and look at them. So it's all part of the process. Do you edit them? So I never crop on my computer. This is how I cropped it in the camera. And that's a real big uh, thing for me. I really wanted to train myself because images are made up of graphic elements and they all relate to the frame in some sort of way. And for me, trying to find that magic spot where all the elements arrange, where they seem like there's that feng shui moment where everything seems to be in balance and it's in balance with the frame. So I don't want to crop in camera, and then when I get it home, I do some tweaking of some color saturation, or if one area is a little bit dark and I'm trying to pull out some detail, or one area is a little bit too bright. <clears throat> but in general, I try not to fiddle too much. Um, so I'm not, at least, I'll show you something at the very end, but all of what I'm showing you here, there isn't a whole lot of digital manipulation. I'm really trying to express what stopped me, so that when you look at it, maybe you can feel the same sort of thing. I'm on the beach, I see a little flash of light off to my side, and I know when that little beacon goes off, I gotta go find it. And of course, I walked up the beach, and this is where, what I saw when I got up to the, uh, the sand dune. 
Mm. Or we're out in the, um, we're out in uh, Fort Tryon Park in Upper Manhattan and it's snowing. A friend came to town and we were just walking around because it was snowing and it was so much fun. Um, and I had just taken a, a class with Jay Micells, who's an, a really good New York photographer who I adore. And he had shown a bunch of his work. This is what I took when I was looking this way, and I turned around, and this is what I took when I turned around. And about a week later, we were walking through this esplanade, and I was just exiting on the other side, and Janice was yelling through the, the snow and the wind, turn around, turn around! <laughs> and so I turned around, and there it was. So this is really as much her photo as it is mine. Okay, so here I am in um, the summer of 1957. I'm about a year and a half with my cousin. I think that's a camera case that I have in my hand, so it might have been preordained that this is where I was going to end up. But we're smeared with something. I had no idea, chocolate ice cream or dirt or whatever. Because, you know, as we uh, grow from this age into adulthood, when we're this age, we are the best visual explorers we will ever be. Because... We're like little beings from Mars. We've never seen what we're looking at. And so everything fascinates us. Um, whether it's, you know, whether it's, well, what am I looking at here in my hand? Or the texture of something, or the sidewalk, or the fire engine when it races by, or the people on the sidewalk. And when you get to be this age, when I'm about 22, I, I thought I knew, but I no, really didn't. You know, you start to lose that. <laughs> so by this stage, you're, you've seen so much that you stop seeing it. You have to. You can't possibly see yeah. it all. Yeah. So when you pull up to a stoplight, you don't see the stoplight. You just see the symbol, red. It means stop. You stop, and you're somewhere else in your head. And that happens all the time when you get to this age. And by the time you get to this point, <laughs> you are way beyond that. So... And, I've, and I came to know this a little bit better because I read this book. It's called On Looking by Alexander Horowitz. Um, this book is in the uh, Montgomery Public Library as an audio book if you are interested in it. She's an animal behaviorist um, at Cornell University. She wrote a book on how her dog, dog sees, and then she decided to take a bunch of walks in her neighborhood with all kinds of people, a bug person, a metallurgist, a doctor, and they all saw the world through their filters like we see the world through our own filters. And then she took one with her 18-month-old son, and she said that, that was the best set of walks she took. Because it took us an hour to get to the corner. <laughs> he was just fascinated by everything. And she said, I realized that, you know, when I started thinking about how neuroscience and our biology works, and how we grow into human adulthood, that this is... So, if you want to see better, we got to try and see more like we did when we were children. And part of the way to that is to relax, but there are other ways to get there, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. This is Betty Edwards, and she wrote this book, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. This book is taught in most beginning art courses, and even before I bought my first camera, I was trying to learn how to draw, and a friend said, you got to read this book. And I read it, and there's a an exercise in it where she has a picture of a contour drawing by Picasso of Stravinsky, the side of the brain. Well, science has since proven that it's a much more complicated thing than just right and left, but there was a real essence, a real nugget of wisdom in what she was getting at. So she said, take an hour or two, pen, pencil, piece of paper, clear your head, and just look at what it is you're looking at. If you have to break it down into quadrants, work through each quadrant. Look at how this line relates to that line, or this angle to that angle. And just work through it. And as you are, pay attention to your state of mind. And I thought, okay, I'm suspicious. I draw like a third grader. So when I was done and I rotated up, the book is on the left and my drawing is on the right. This was back in 1998. And I was really flabbergasted. This was like the big bang for me. Because up until this point, you know, I, I had no concept about the different aspects of seeing. And this, everything just went... And really, ultimately, it started me down the road to something that changed my life. 
So I knew this was the first time I had consciously practiced, and I didn't realize it as much until later, of working to get into the flow state or the zone. You know, when you're drawing something, you're working with something, you get so absorbed. It doesn't even have to be art. You can be in your garden or whatever. You get so focused and so pulled into it. Time disappears. The world is gone. You don't, you don't even recognize yourself. It's just what you're doing there in front of you. That's another way you can access this frame of mind, this state of mind, to be able to move through the world and see in this way. So, a couple years, oh, and, and these are some images. They treat, they have uh, workshops, and on the left is the first day of a workshop, and on the right is the fifth day of the workshop of some students who took these. And it's pretty stunning. These are from people around the country. This isn't about learning how to draw in five days. This is learning how to see better in five days. That's what it's all about. And then the development of the skill of coordinating the eye and the hand to be able to do this. So that's a much longer process. But you got to be able to see first. Okay. A couple years later, I get a digital camera. Um, I had fiddled with trying to learn how to draw, but I got involved in some other things. Okay, so this is the one of the first, this is the first time I used it. Oh, wow. Oh. This is the Gates exhibit in Central Park, the Jean-Claude Christo yeah. Gates yeah. exhibit in 2004 or 2005. Mm. This is what it looked like when I took it on the board. You can get a real strong sense visually of the vortex that's pulling you in. But when you rotate it right side up, this is what it looks like. Okay. And goodness. wow. so... <laughs> So when you're looking at Betty Edwards drawing upside down, your brain can't figure out what it's looking at. It forgets the name. It forgets the associations. Think about it. Everything that's happened to you in your lifetime, you've drawn associations to it. Ultimately, you stop seeing what you're looking at and you see the associations. It really requires you slowing down and really paying attention to really see what's there. And seeing in this way helps you do that. I didn't realize it. But I think I spent five years learning to clear my head in a very intuitive, unintellectually based way to mm -hmm. see the world with a calm mind. Because yeah. actually, sometimes I sit down and try and like clear my head, and it's like that works for about ten seconds, <laughs> you know. But when I go out with my camera, or I'm I see something and I'm stopped, I don't know why. It just I am in that zone, and I can stay there for a really long time. It's like you know, an extended field of perception. And I think it's partly because of the work that I did with this board. And this is some of the work that came out of that. Wow. This is, this is what? What do you all say? I think it's a coal miner coming out of the coal area. Jenna said it looks like an opera singer, singer standing off stage. Or a Mayan king coming out of the temple. It's my um, fire extinguisher on the kitchen counter. <laughs> so here's the extinguisher. Here's the fan in the window. This is. We lived in a New York apartment that, for two year, days out of the year, the sunlight would come through the window, and this was one of them. Wow. And it was six o'clock in the morning, and I was in there in my jammies, and I saw. Oh my God! So I went and got my board and my camera and took that picture. And it turns out that I really adore that. Um, Actually, this belonged in the other section. This is a puddle reflection. Wow. Uh, but this is more of the board work. Um, this is blind luck. So fruit vendors are ubiquitous in New York City, and I was taking a picture of that, and this taxi cab drove into the scene, and that they're also ubiquitous, and it was just a wonderful, like, oh. It is. The universe just, like, <laughs> shined its light on me and said, you're such a dope, but we're going to give you a, a little gift this morning. Here you go. We're on vacation out in San Francisco at the uh, Fisherman's Wharf, and we went into a, a flower shop, and it was these wonderful sunflowers. Mm -hmm. I'm up uptown in um, Washington Heights, and the shaved ice guy walks by mm -hmm. with his cart, and they take a picture of it. Mm -hmm. And it's November, and everything is dead except this one rose hanging over the side of this rose bush on a fence as I walk by. And it's this big. Mm -hmm. And I can't believe that there's actually a rose still there and it's that big. And then there's something about the way the paper 
interacted with the lens of the camera that created that three-dimensional feel. I go on vacation to um, Gloucester and the guy next door is painting his house and I'm upstairs in my room and I see him and I take a picture. Okay, so five years of working like that. In the course of doing that sort of thing, um, somebody says, this is very much like the pictorial photographers. I don't know who they are. I go looking. Alfred Stieglitz is a big proponent at the beginning of photography as a fine art where the, the, the pictorialists would fiddle with the photo. They would superimpose um, negatives. They would fiddle in the darkroom and create images that were other than just a straight replication of what they saw. They were very artful um, and I loved them. Um, and so I read everything I could get my hands on, related to them, looked up their work, joined a pictorial photographer at <coughs> America Club in New York City. And then Stieglitz said, eh, no, I really don't like this stuff. I want straight shooting. So I was like, well, you could have said that up front in your book. You know, <laughs> so I start looking, and I find Edward Weston and Bernice Abbott and a whole other bunch of people who are shooting, shooting straight. And eventually I decided to give up the board um, and move on and just start shooting straight work. Um, Now, I'm showing to you this all to you in a sort of compartmentalized ways and linear, but it's not how it happened. So I still use the board. I started paying attention to what Stiegel had said. I started sort of shifting back and forth. I was reading all kinds of different things. And um, I started reading some books on graphic design and composition. And I know, up, at the, to, up to this point, I know that part of the practice, um, the practicing the art of seeing means you, to let go. But I think before you can let go, it's the same is true with painting, before you can like paint abstracts or get wonky, you really have to learn the basics. And so I feel like I needed a foundation in graphic design and composition. So I spent a lot of time reading on it, and I decided that learning to see the graphics elements in the visual world were really important for me as a training ground so that I could then just forget it and look. And so this is some of the work as I went back and looked through what I had that um, I think are examples of that sort of thing, form and shape. The world is full of form and shape. Just look around the room. If you forget looking at any of these pieces of artwork and you just look, there's lots of squares and triangles. Um, the beams, the, the lights, uh, it, there's all sorts of shape. Your round heads, um, the round circle of that lens on the camera. Um, this is, um, I forget the name of this place downtown. Uh, anyways, I, I, what really, I was struck by it and I took the picture and when I looked at it some more I realized this is full of shapes, rectangles and squares, um, plus color um, and line. Um, and I know that's what stopped me. But I wasn't thinking that at the time. Yes? Um, when you take the picture, it's just like that. You just enhance all the color? Well, in this one, it wasn't too hard because this is a really colorful spot. Mm -hmm. But it was also, the camera's <laughs> lens isn't nearly as good as ours. And so it had a blue cast to it because it was fighting to try and find out what the real color balance was. Mm -hmm. um, I was... Uh, it was kind of low light and blue fluorescent. Um, so I, I made an adjustment to the color balance, which enhanced saturation a bit. But this is a very colorful spot, so I didn't do too much with that in this image. And, this, and I, I try not to do too much of it. I'm actually weaning myself from that rule. And the work you see behind me, I'll get to that at the end, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, more shapes when they were building the new EGI museum downtown and I was roaming around on the construction site. Mm -hmm. It was just some, there's something about the arrangement of the, these angles mm -hmm. and these shapes and those little dots in the, um, I think they were using them for scaffolding. Um, plus that, those, the, the, the diagonals of that orange mm -hmm. color. A uh, building downtown. Um, I, uh, I'm a real big fan. Yes? Is is there any particular time of day that you uh, take the nope. photographs? Just random? Just the golden hour at, at, at dawn and dusk, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, mid mid uh, day, noon in the summer is brutal, but the light is like mm -hmm. 
blasting amazing. November, December, January, February, the light, no matter what time of day, is amazing because it's low on the horizon and it creates this soft glow. So I don't worry about when I go out. Um, I'm just going out and if there's, I'm going out to try and see whatever visual wonder the world is going to reveal to me at that particular moment because it'll never be the same. I've gone back to that spot on the beach and stood a dozen times and could even, I can't even get close to what happened on that particular day. Um, and I've been by this space um, a couple of times since then and um, I just don't see it. And the light was just in a certain way on this day. And what I love about this is the shapes. I don't care what it is. I'm just really taken by this strong sense of formalism of shape has nothing to do with what I'm looking at. It's all about the shapes and the color that 